Hello and welcome back. Uh, in this series, we're slowly building up a one-bit vacuum tube computer uh, that is inspired pretty heavily by the Motorola MC14500. Uh, we have made some changes. Uh, most notably, we changed out the logic unit for an arithmetic logic unit, so I've been dubbing it the UE14500. Uh, but a large bulk of the rest of the architecture has remained unchanged. And what we're gonna talk about today actually relies really heavily on the unique architecture that Motorola built into the MC14500. And that's because I wanna talk about conditionals today. In other words, if-then statements. If A equals something, then do B. Uh, and the way that the Motorola chip handles it is really unique. And as far as I know, I don't think there's another chip out there that handles conditionals quiet like this Motorola chip does. Uh, so let's hop over to the bench. We'll take a look at how it handles it, and then we'll build up those components, plug them into our massive uh, collection of tubes that we're building up, and uh, maybe we'll give something a quick test. Uh, so let's hop over there and get started. This is my notebook of uh, printed out reference material. Uh, I use this notebook quite a lot. I have a lot of really weird, interesting things in here. Uh, for example, I've got the patent information on the Adatron tube. Uh, I've got a whole section here dedicated to printouts from the IBM 604. Uh, this has been incredibly useful, uh, but I have an entire tab in here dedicated to the MC14500. We can see that here in the introduction, uh, we've got the basic block diagram for it, uh, as well as a list of all the instructions that we can do. Now the UE14500, the vacuum tube version that we're building up, uh, the instructions are a little bit different, uh, most notably uh, from instruction 0001, uh, all the way up to instruction 0111 are totally different because that's uh, now relating to our new ALU. Uh, but from instruction 1000 on, these are all the same. And uh, most importantly, we'll notice that we have an STO and an STOC, as well as an OEN instruction. And these three instructions are going to enable us to do uh, conditionals, if then statements. OEN in particular is extremely important for achieving this. So let's flip ahead to the chapter dedicated to OEN. And you can see here that they even list chapter seven as OEN and the if-then structure. Now OEN is just an instruction that will store whatever data is on the data bus into the output enable register. So if we remember back to our block diagram, uh, we can see that it OEN is listed in the top right. Uh, and then the output of OEN goes into an AND gate. Uh, the other input of that AND gate is shared with an OR gate that has STO and STOC on it. And then the output of that AND gate goes to pin number two, which is the write pin. What this means is that the write pin will not go high unless the OEN register is storing a one and an STO or STOC command has been executed. In particular, we can take a look at how they kind of designed the minimal ICU system in uh, chapter four here. Now, I won't go into too much detail about this entire uh, minimal ICU system. I have an entire another series where I actually built this exact system as it's laid out here on a breadboard. Uh, and I learned a ton about how the MC14500 interacts with uh, memory and system inputs and system outputs. But what's really important to note about this is that they're using the right pin to switch between inputs or outputs. Um, so the right pin is essentially what is allowing them to either read from memory or write to memory. And if the output enable register is not storing a one, the write pin will never toggle. So if we go back to chapter seven here, we can start to get an idea of how we're going to execute conditional statements. So they give an example here of using the MC14500 to sound a horn, turn off the power, and turn on an oven temperature light when the over temperature switch is closed, meaning that it has a one input. Uh, and before we take a look at the actual code, this I think is an amazing example to use because it really drives home the point of this one bit uh, industrial control unit. 
It was not meant for generic computing purposes. It was meant to replace logic in industrial environments, meaning it works really well in finite state machines. It also means that we can misuse this design to do generic computing stuff. Uh, so uh, it doesn't have to be uh, an over temperature switch. It can be a block of memory. Uh, so to take a look at the uh, example code that they have here, uh, they load OTS, which is the switch state. Uh, if this is one, it stores a one into the result register. If this is zero, it stores a zero into the result register. Then we execute the OEN instruction, and we do that based on the value of the result register. Uh, now this is another interesting point to note. Uh, because the minimal ICU system is designed in such a way that the result register can be circled back around as an input. Uh, so we just select the address that the result register is sitting on, and that is an input onto the data bus. This is uh, actually so important that they state up here the physical connection allowing the result register to be addressed as an input is so useful it should always be utilized. Uh, and much, much later when we get into memory, we're gonna see that that is something that I am working very hard to build into the memory. Uh, but what this means is that we can now turn the output enable register on or off based on the value stored in the result register. Now, what is really, really important to note here is that the following instructions are all executed regardless of the state of the output enable register. But if the output enable register is zero, even if we execute these instructions, the output enable register is not allowing the write pin to be toggled, which means nothing is being written to memory or to external systems. So in this way, you can see that at the very beginning, depending on what we load in, we can turn the output enable register off, uh, which essentially skips the next few functions until we force a one back into the output enable register. So to compare this to a different type of architecture, I think a more conventional way of doing a conditional would be to do something like a branch if not equal. Essentially, we tell the processor to jump to a different location in the program counter, skipping a collection of code. Uh, but when Motorola was designing the MC14500, they really wanted the chip to be able to be used in a massive array of configurations. And who knows what the program counter was going to look like. It could be massively long, it could be massively short, uh, it could be reading something directly off of uh, magnetic tape, hint, hint, wink, wink, or it could be doing something completely different. So they needed to develop this architecture that would allow conditionals to happen without actually having to know how the rest of the system is built. And I think that's just really cool. They came up with this really out of the box thinking and got it done. Um, and I'm really grateful for it because it means that I could build up the processor portion of the computer first and think about memory and program control later. And speaking of how we're going to build up the processor, let's take a look at how we're going to implement uh, the output enable register as well as the write control. So by now, I think you're all pretty familiar with uh, this logic diagram that we have here. This is the uh, UE14500 as built with logic gates only. And we've built a large majority of this, but the output enable register that I wanna to build today is right up here in the top right. And you may notice that this actually looks uh, really familiar. And that's because we're using the uh, six NOR gate design that we used uh, for the input enable register as well as the instruction register. And actually this is a totally interchangeable board. I could just pull one of the instruction register boards out pop it in down here, and that would work as our output enable register, uh, which means that I actually cut this board up uh, back when I built the uh, instruction register uh, many months ago. Uh, but there's a couple extra things that we have to build. Uh, the first is that our uh, clock signal coming into output enable register uh, is a NAND gate, and then to handle our uh, write pin output, we just need an AND gate there, uh, but in order to build an AND gate, we have to build a NAND gate and an inverter. Uh, it's a little convoluted, 
But uh, as complicated as all of that sounds, really all we're doing is building a D flip flop today, and then we're building an AND gate with a whole lot of cathode follower buffers just to make sure that I have nice, clean, strong signals to go to memory in the future. Uh, so I've got the boards, it's time to solder them up and uh, hopefully give them a little bit of a test. All right, well, uh, you can see that we've got it all set up here, uh, but it is uh, pretty janky, if I'm being honest. Uh, but that's because we're missing uh, quite a few boards. Uh, there's supposed to be some boards that go right here in the middle. I haven't built those yet. That's for uh, the SKZ operation. Uh, but the way I have this set up is that I have large power buses running down the left and right, and then they feed across, uh, giving the tubes the uh, 24 volts, minus 12 volts, and ground that they need. Um, and this uh, big right board here is supposed to get its power from the far right bus board here, uh, as well as kind of a uh, horizontal bus that runs all the way across to this big bus over here. Uh, but since I'm missing this board in the middle here, and I'm missing the uh, end pieces over here, uh, it didn't have any power, so I had to run some uh, jumper wires here to pull some power from over here. Uh, also, the uh, output enable register, which is right here, um, it gets its uh, NAND gate control from right here, uh, but I'm pulling the inverted output out of it, uh, and then I will invert that for a display board that goes here, and then buffer it, so that way I get a nice, clean, strong signal. Uh, but since that board doesn't exist, um, well, we have to set the output enable register to a zero in order for it to work because a zero would mean that the inverted output out of the output enable register is a one. Uh, and that's what we're uh, right now inputting into our right board over here. Now, if the right board looks like an unplanned disaster of tubes, that's because uh, it is. <laughs> I initially had a totally different design, uh, but over the past uh, couple of weeks when I started working on figuring out the design for memory, I realized that I needed to shift a bunch of buffers to the processor uh, and I kind of didn't have space for it. So I did my best and tried to stuff them onto this single board here. I think it's gonna work all right. And really at the end of the day, that's all that actually matters. Uh, so in order to give this a test, 
I need to uh, simulate some of the instructions that are going to come from the instruction register up there. Now those instructions come down the far right here, cut across the top, and are fed to the different areas. Uh, but you'll notice that all of that is uh, still missing. It is yet to be built, so that's what these wires here are. The uh, purple wire here is my data, and I'll set that to zero because we want to store the opposite in our uh, output enable register here. Uh, I want to do an output enable operation. That's going to be this white wire, so I will take that uh, and connect that up to 24 volts. Uh, and then the clock is actually this uh, little blue wire over here. I just tap this onto 24 volts. That should clock a zero into the output enable register. I've got a little display here that will hopefully light up. Yeah, there we go, all right, awesome. I don't know if you can see it with all the uh, lighting in the room. Um, so that's good, that means that our output enable register is uh, storing a zero and the inverse of that is uh, coming out then that comes into our right board here uh, i am measuring the right pin output with my uh, little voltmeter here you can see it's at 3.33 volts now if i change to an sto operation uh, that's going to be this little green wire here We'll make that an STO operation. Again, our output didn't change, uh, but we should see this output go high when the clock goes high. So if I touch the clock here to 24 volts, uh, we should see that bump up. Yeah, there we go. Uh, it's showing 20, 21 volts. That's awesome. So that's a logic high, that's a logic low. There we go. So our right pin is outputting whenever the clock pulses, that is Perfect, awesome. So now we have uh, an output enable register that we can turn on and off uh, based on instructions and anything else to mask the uh, right output, which will ultimately go to our memory and control whether we're writing or reading from memory. So there we go, we've got conditional functionality now. <laughs> this thing is getting really, really, really close. Uh, but right now, this uh, new additions down here all seem to be working perfectly. I am super happy about that. We are so close, there's just a handful of boards, less than 10 boards to solder up now. <laughs> That is unbelievable. Uh, so hopefully in the next episode, we'll get it really, really close to being finished. And then I think in the episode after that, we're going to fire the entire thing up and give it a test as a finished processor. So we are, oh man, we're so close. Uh, but I want to thank you guys so much for watching. And I hope to see you in the next episode.